and we are this has brought us right up to um returning from the lunch break and thanks to everybody that that hung in there during this time so our afternoon session is we're going to have managers present herds to the panel um speakers from the morning session two of the, the that will be the panel speakers from the morning session to evaluate the efficacy of test and remove in some herds of interest that they might have that are they're wondering whether they are candidates for that. So we have 30 minute presentations by each uh, of each state or area of interest with 15 minutes of that dedicated to the presentation by the, the questioners and 15 minutes for panelist feedback. So to start that out is going to be a Wyoming group uh, made up of Greg Anderson, Hank Edwards, Pat Nilica, and they're going to be talking about the Whiskey Mountain Herd. And I think that Pat Nilica has had the most discussion today about how to pronounce his last name, which we found out was Silica, but with an N. And I don't know if he's leading this off, but he is a project leader and biologist from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, currently working with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho uh, tribes located on the Wind Reser River Reservation in West Central um, Wyoming. So. Uh, th thanks, thanks Peregrine. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> the last name is, is challenging for most. Um, thanks for the introduction. I, I'm actually going to turn this over to Greg Anderson. He is uh, the resident expert on the Whiskey uh, Mountain Sheep Herd. Um, I had some work with that herd back in the late 90s, uh, but uh, again, Greg is uh, most current. So I'll turn that over to Greg. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, I'm going to start my screen sharing here. Folks can let me know if this goes. Okay. Uh, we see yeah. Beginning yeah, we see, PowerPoint yeah. we do. Okay. Yeah. And I think what I need to do is, okay, is that on everybody's screen now? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to talk briefly about our Whiskey Mountain Bighorn sheep population in Wyoming. And you can see in the inset there, the kind of purple highlighted area sort of gives you a reference to where we're at in Wyoming. And then zoomed in here, uh, the red outline is our herd outline, basically encompasses the northern Wind River Range in kind of northwest Wyoming. This herd to the state of Wyoming has significant historical value. It's really our seed stock for many of the herds that we augmented throughout the state back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, into the early 90s. And sheep from Whiskey Mountain went to other states as well, either um, establishing herds or augmenting herds that had been extirpated in certain areas. So the blood from this herd, uh, it really is found throughout the Western United States. And at its peak, uh, we probably had about 2,000 sheep in this herd that primarily wintered in low elevation sites along the northern edge of this herd unit. We had a catastrophic all-age die-off back in 1990-91, and at the time we don't know where the, the mnemonic uh, bacteria exposure came from. The sheep that we collected at the time and got to the lab were, the, the culprit was diagnosed as Pasturella genera. At the time, we didn't have the lab diagnostics that we do now. So uh, we don't know exactly what was occurring back that far. Uh, since that time, we have had chronic, persistent, low lamb recruitment in the area. We know we have chronic lamb pneumonia on an annual basis. Over the last 25, 30 years now, I guess, close to, we are down to approximately 500 sheep in this herd. So a substantial decline in numbers. We went from production where we were overpopulated and couldn't get enough sheep out of the area to where, where the herd has really been decimated over the last 25 years. Uh, to give you an example of what's occurred, 
This is simply the number of sheep that we classify on an annual basis. So the number that we count on the ground and aerially throughout the winter ranges in this herd unit. And you can see from the early 90s where we used to count, you know, eight to 900 sheep with not very much effort, frankly. And it's declined more recently to, you know, 250 to 300 sheep throughout the herd unit. Now we certainly don't get all of those and that gets back to the, the likelihood that we probably have around four to 500 sheep currently in the herd, but down substantially from what it was historically. I'm going to show you a chart here with a lot of lines on it, but uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the green bars and the yellow line, disregarding the white and orange lines. The yellow line represents animals that we have seen in what we call hunt area 10, which historically was uh, the, the main corpus of this population, the low elevation winter ranges where we wintered probably around 12 to 1300 of those 2000 sheep. And you can see in the past, even post die off, as area 10 went for our classifications for lamb numbers, so the herd unit went up to about 2014. Now those low elevation populations continue to decline. And you can see from 2014 on, so 2015 through current history, we have substantially lower recruitment in area 10. The herd unit overall is higher. What has happened is those low elevation sheep that we have access to, to get hands on, to, to do research with, uh, to do disease testing, they have declined so precipitously that they no longer drive the recruitment factors in the overall population. That means we've got sheep uh, dispersed throughout the herd unit at higher elevations that are difficult to access that um, are driving the recruitment in the population. Overall, it's still declining because the numbers are down substantially, but more substantially in area 10. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Um, these three circles demonstrate the historical um, stronghold for this population. And you can see they're kind of down near the Northern edge of this herd and a highway runs right on the north boundary there. We had good access to capture sheep in these areas to disease test them. This is formerly where we used to capture sheep and transplant them to other locations. This is the occupied area overall within the herd unit. You can see it's the entire Northern Wind River range. Very little of the occupied habitat is associated with those low elevation winter ranges where we have good access to these sheep. So this next slide then, um, I'm, I'm touching on what I view as potential logistical problems to kind of hand over to the, the uh, group that's been discussing what they've done earlier so, so you can get a feel for what we're dealing with and tell us if we have uh, potential value for testing coal in an area like this. So this slide, the green highlighted area on the left edge of the picture is all Forest Service wilderness area. The orange highlighted area on the right side of the screen is Wind River Reservation. So we have limited access to those areas to do work on the ground, aerial captures or installations on the ground, as you might imagine in wilderness areas. And you can see that's the bulk of the occupied area. You can see a couple little areas outside of the wilderness area on the northern end of that occupied stuff. That's formerly where we've done most of our captured disease testing um, and other work when it's hands on with these sheep. We do have a pretty good relationship with the Wind River Reservation and, and uh, you know, Pat runs a lot of their biological program. So we have access to sheep on the Wind River Reservation, but we don't have management authority there. So anything we propose would need to be approved by both the Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone tribes. And that's kind of that Eastern finger of what I'm showing you. So limited access to, to sheep that we're dealing with now. And I showed you three black circles earlier on the Northern edge. This is currently our wintering populations. And again, they all mingle in the summertime, but these are sort of localized winter areas that we're aware of from years and years of surveys and, and radio collar work. Uh, and you can see the vast majority of that is substantially within wilderness, not that we uh, 
completely off limits, but it prevent, presents some definite logistical challenges to getting hands on the sheet. And that now, if you think back to the graph that I showed of uh, lamb recruitment on an annual basis, the areas at the northern edge of that screen are a substantially smaller part of the population than the blue areas within the Forest Service wilderness. And again, um, as far as getting up and doing groundwork, I have been up and darted sheep on the ground in some of that uh, stronghold in the high mountains, but this is what it looks like from the ground up there. So again, substantial challenge to getting, uh, you know, a number of personnel up in there to do groundwork. And then uh, a final slide here, giving you an idea of the distances in that landscape that I showed you in the former picture where you can't really go as the crow flies, you've got to go down, around, up, around another uh, chasm and up again to get to some of these areas. So we have done significant testing in the past and um, I, I don't want to get into the, the weeds as far as what we have there, but suffice to say, we know we have a suite of bacterial pathogens associated with the pneumonia complex in sheep. We know we have a substantial amount of mycoplasma over pneumonia. Uh, some years when we've done significant testing of 30 to 40 sheep, we run anywhere between 30 to 60% pre uh, prevalence of mycoplasma. And then we did a, a year, it wasn't test and remove necessarily, but I um, had a year where we removed all of the lambs with clinical symptoms of pneumonia that were coughing violently, hacking uncontrollable coughs, and 80% of them had mycoplasma over pneumonia when we actually removed those animals. Many of them had uh, physical lesions on their lungs. So again, we know we have the suite of bacteria. And again, uh, Francis touched on some stuff that they did in Idaho prior to test and cull. And we've done many of those same things in the whiskey herd where we put out mineral blocks across the landscape. I've tried to deworm the sheep. Again, we did a year where we actually removed six sheep on the landscape and nothing seems to have been effective at this point. We have not had hands on sheep where we've tested them in the field and then removed, uh, you know, based on what pathogens they have present. So I, I guess for consideration of the discussion, what I want to throw out is we have a population scattered across a landscape like you see in this slide, high elevations. They, uh, many of them live up at those high elevations, 11,500 feet year round. Wilderness, so difficult for aerial access, ground installations such as ground traps, uh, next to impossible ground darting possible, but uh, limited effectiveness. We have a small portion of animals, my guess is around 20% that come to these low elevation winter ranges on the northern end of that occupied habitat that formerly were the core of this herd that we do have access to and to get hands on. So I guess for the group's consideration, looking at a landscape like this, knowing we have these bacterial pathogens throughout the population, knowing the population mingles in the summertime, and we've got about maybe 20% of this population we can effectively get hands on on a regular basis. Uh, what's the consensus of doing work like test and remove in a landscape like this? And I will leave that there, and I know Pat and Stan were going to touch on another herd that is just south of this one. Okay. So are they going to do that together right now? No, Perry, let's, uh, if you don't mind, let's are, do We're going to do the, please. Okay. So let's just go ahead and um, talk. then we have 15 minutes for feedback from the panelists. Yeah, so I, again, I will throw off the question, thinking of that landscape for the states that have done work like this. I know everyone has logistical challenges, but essentially, if you can get hands on 
20% of the animals in a population dispersed across a mountain range known to have fairly high prevalence rate of mycoplasma over pneumonia amongst various subwintering groups. Is this a procedure that's worthwhile? Greg, can I just ask one question? Did you, um, you said they had high prevalence rates. Was that uh, repeatedly on PCR or that was on by yep. nasal swab with PCR? Yep, that was through PCR, and but not repeated on individual animals. I will say um, over the last two years, we have had an intensive lamb survival study going on trying to identify exactly when, where, and why lambs are dying. And what we found is roughly 50% of our juvenile mortality are things that are associated with any ungulate population, predation, accidents, uh, there are some abandonments, and then 50% of our lamb mortality is associated directly with pneumonia. And again, similar to what everyone else has talked about, we're looking at, uh, you know, midsummer to late summer mortality associated with pneumonia on those summer ranges. And that, I assume, you know, based on our demographics, my idea is that 50% pneumonia mortality is additive. And that's why our population is declining. But yeah, um, back to real briefly, PCR analysis based on nasal swabs is what our mycoplasma figures are based on. Francis, I guess I would be interested. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, you know your area, so that part, but um, I, I guess you've been getting in there to do other studies though and to do sampling. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a way to uh, do more intensive work in some of those areas you've already been working in. Yeah, the catch 22 there Francis is the areas that we've done work in historically and, and the last time we sampled extensively in there was 2014. Those populations that I showed you with those little dots on the north end of the occupied area, they were substantially bigger. They made up a larger portion of this population. They've been the hardest hit and declined the most of the groups wandering throughout that occupied habitat. They're now a very small portion of the herd. So that's one of the points I was trying to get across. Historically, we've had good access to a high percentage of this herd. We now have very poor access to the majority of the herd, good access to a small percentage of the herd. And that's kind of the, the balance there. Do, you know, can we be effective with something like this where we have access to a small percentage of a, a widely dispersed herd? So the studies you're doing right now are in, on that small portion that's accessible? Yeah, yeah, all the colored ewes that we have and the associated lambs that uh, we're capturing at the beginning of summer are associated with those low elevation winter ranges. That in itself has been problematic as we've seen the shifting dynamic that has uh, accelerated over recent years. We started out with 24 collared ewes associated with that study. This last year, um, and well, a, a few months ago, we could only access uh, seven of those collared ewes for capture to install bits for future follow up on capturing their lambs. So that percentage that we have access to, even from a few years ago, has declined as far as collared adults. Really? So they're changing where they winter? Huh? Well, yeah, and there's some other dynamics there that have, have occurred, but yeah, it's been more and more difficult to capture sheep. The, the bottom line is um, small percentage of sheep <laughs> that we have access to, um, larger percentage of sheep that I don't want to say they're inaccessible, but very, very difficult logistics. And I know other people have dealt with that, you know, listening to their talks as well. So. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I think you'd have to figure out some way to work around that. Um, I, I don't really even know if that, if that small wintering area, is that even, is that, that only is one group of sheep or, um, <laughs> yeah, we sorry. Have, is, I'm just wondering if that is that like one group or is it sort of a mix mix of a bunch of summer ranges or I don't really understand how the sheep work over there. Obviously, so we have I'm trying to yeah to to primarily three three low elevation groups they migrate into the high country and kind of mix in some of the same habitat in the high country and have very high site fidelity to their winter sites when they come back down. But three of those areas, yeah. And again, maybe totaling 20% of the population that we might have access to. Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, I think it, I think the, the overriding question is if if in any herd you can only get your hands on 20 percent does does that limit it does limit but it doesn't limit it yeah. to the point that it's not worth trying i i think that's the question perhaps how, how many sheep are there did you say greg that are in in the accessible portion so we yeah we've got probably 500 sheep in this population between four and 500 total and at those low elevation sites that we could have access to, we've got a little over a hundred. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you'd be trying something new. The only reason I think it might be worth trying is that you could at least reduce the prevalence. Um, you obviously wouldn't be able to clear it directly. Um, with that kind of access, but that's quite a few sheep. Um, yeah, I don't know. It would be something new. Okay, that's part of the question, I guess, that, that we had on our end. You know, it sounds like other folks attempting these operations have had hands on a significantly higher proportion of their population. And you, you said yeah. you were around 60, 60 to 80 percent in some of those subherds? Well, yeah, those were herds that weren't infected, though. I okay. mean, after we did, you know, after we um, sampled that much, we were like, well, I guess you don't need to do anything more here. Um, I think you'd be breaking new ground. So I can't, you know, I mean, in a way you could say, well, nobody's done this and there's a good chance it wouldn't be successful. But on the other hand, what's your alternative? And it's possible, you know, like the thing, the only reason I think there might be some success is that, um, you know, in Hell's Canyon, we had populate, and there is the natural clearance thing. That's the only thing that would save you is if you could just sort of knock it back enough that, um, some of the subherds would just clear it on their own based on the lower prevalence that you have after test and remove. I, okay. That's that's my guess or you know my my logic why it might be worth it. But yeah, I so I'm gonna put you on the spot here <laughs> and ask you this. Already, <laughs> we already did that. <laughs> In air because th this is really our dilemma with this herd. Again, like I said, we've tried all the things you've tried. Nothing's working. It's dwindling. It's disappearing on the landscape. Um, it's, so we're kind of desperate. But if if you, but I'm going to make you pick a number. Well, maybe I can't make you pick a number. But um, what would you think a, a good threshold would be for handling animals for testing them to be effective with the test and remove. 
If you can get your hands on 50%, is that acceptable? Do you need 60%? Uh, obviously, I mean, you're thinking like we are 20 percent a little on the low end to, to be effective, perhaps. You think 50 percent effective? I, I know I, no one's going to no one's going to hold you to it. We know it's a guess, but you have more <laughs> than the rest. Taped. Of the yeah. <laughs> All right. This is what you get for being an expert. No, I'm not. <laughs> You know, I can't, I, I really don't know if you could do anything with 50%. I really, I mean, I just don't know. Okay. I mean, I didn't really think that I would, that the, we would be able to do what we did in Health Canyon. I really didn't. I was just going at it from, well, let's try it in these accessible herds and we can at least prove a concept. And then I got excited and just went and tried it. So um, you know, I guess, yeah, I don't know. And the thing is, you're not giving, getting a, a constant 50% because you're, at least the way you're approaching it here on the winter range, some herds you might be getting more or some summering groups you might be getting more and then others less. But then of course they're all mi mixing on the winter range. But you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no, I follow you. I mean, bottom line is it's a pretty small percentage of the sheep that we can get our hands on. And they generally, they're likely to have contact at some point during their life cycle with ones that we don't ever touch. Yeah. Can I, can I jump in here just for a second? Um, this is Okay, we're running out of time. Just to, to, just to let you know, you have like a minute left before we have to go to the next presentation. I guess I'll two minutes quickly say, you know, one of the other problems with this herd is the presence of sinus tumors. And I think that sinus tumors may be more of an issue than at least in this herd than we're given it credit for. Cause certainly with our cost specific lamb mortality, surprisingly enough, um, multocida is knocking off more lambs than ova pneumonia. So, Going back to what Mary mentioned earlier, as far as uh, sinus tumors and multocida, I think there could be other things going on here and sinus tumors is certainly gonna complicate um, what we're trying to do. Well, I would like to continue this discussion with you guys. We got um, sheep from Whiskey Basin in Hell's Canyon. So, you know, if, there's, if you think there's a benefit to continuing on, I'm, I'm open. Well, certainly we're running out of time. Yeah, if we want to proceed with anything, we're we're going to pick your brain some more. So, but anyway, I appreciate everyone's time and thoughts. Okay, we have if either Emily or Mike Cox have a very short, easily answered question, you can ask it. If not, hold on to it until we're done with the next Wyoming presentation. Okay, they're going to hold on to their questions. Thanks, Greg. Um, okay, we're now going to um, go to the next presentation uh, with Stan Harder, Pat Nilica on the Wind River Indian Reservation Temple Peak Herd. Is that right? And Pat, are you presenting and do you have slides and need to share your screen? Yeah, uh, Perry, Stan Harder is going to do the presenting and uh, we'll take. Okay. I'm going to get started anyway. Okay, we see your screen sharing. Oh, we see your presentation. Okay, so you're seeing the whole thing? Yeah, or it should the... click over into the... We yeah, we're, we're seeing it. your um, presentation mode yet. No idea how to stop that. So... You're good, Stan. Yep, you're good. Okay. So, there it is, uh, yep. The... Temple Peak Bighorn Sheep Herd Unit um, and the Wind River Reservation Herd are interchangeable. As you can see, the collar data on this first map that shows uh, the former hunt area number 11, while it's currently still a hunt area, but we haven't used it as a hunting season for over 20 years, uh, close to 30 actually. Um, 
the bighorn sheep that we collared in, in uh, 2016 and 17, those collar points are shown on this map. Uh, you can get a sense of here from Lander, Pine Dale to the just to the west of this. And we are just barely southeast of what Greg was talking about a few moments ago. If I'm not mistaken, the bulk of these bighorn sheep uh, originated from transplants uh, throughout the last uh, 50 years or so uh, that originated from Whiskey Mountain uh, bighorn sheep herd that Greg just mentioned or talked about. Um, so we have that uh, linkage to disease there. I'm not sure if those bighorn sheep were tested upon the transplants and in the original transplants, but probably some toward the end. Uh, we have transplants that started in 19... Uh, 64, I believe, in Sinks Canyon, which is uh, just southeast or southwest of Lander. You can see that road um, that comes out. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this is the Sinks Canyon area right here. There's another canyon to the southeast. Uh, it's a little Popoja Canyon. And then the North Fork Popoja is right at the western or the northern boundary of Hunter Area 11. Uh, right adjacent to the Wind River Reservation. And then Washakie Rim is the where the bulk of these collars uh, just west southwest of Fort Washakie uh, are. And those, and then the next map I'll show on the next page has Bull Lake Canyon uh, to the north, closer to Dubois. Uh, we have bighorn sheep that were collared there in the last, uh, or in that 2016 and 17 period as well. Um, there were collars. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Um, oops. So you, you can see that Bull Lake Canyon. Uh, there's linkage migrations to the high elevations toward Cathedral Peak and the Cirque of the Towers in this area. Are you seeing my cursor? Yes, we are. Okay. And then it's down at the bottom now. Yeah, I moved up to the Bull Lake Canyon at the top of that map now. And I think there were just two or three rams collared there in 2017. Um, the uh, rams moved up, one of them died right away, and then one moved up to this Wolverine Peak area in the same vicinity where bull uh, uh, rams and ewes from Washakie Rim captures moved up in different uh, patterns to get to the same area that that Bull Lake Canyon ram came from. And we're just barely east of Greg's uh, Whiskey Mountain herd, but there doesn't seem to be, at least based on the collar data that we've got now and observational data, there doesn't seem to be a direct spatial link between those herds at this time. Um, but we definitely have that uh, upward winter, winter range down low by Washakie Rim and the, the other creeks in this area up to the higher elevations in both uh, the reservation and the Shoshone National Forest Popoja Wilderness. Um, we actually have one collared ewe in particular that spent time uh, just north of this Cathedral Peak area and near Hobbs Peak near the reservation boundary. She spent the winters up there in the past few years off and on until the snow got too deep. This year we had a pretty mild winter until mid March when we started getting more snows and that you migrated up just before those snows and is still up in that area. So we've got that winter range and, and summer range concern about whether we would do any test and removal that would remove those linkages plus the fact that we have some animals that are spending their time in the winter months up in the wilderness areas where capture would be difficult at best. So. Um, Pat, do you want to talk about some of the historical observations you've had on the, the reservation and, and the winter ranges there on numbers? Yeah, sure, Stan. So uh, as Stan mentioned, Bull Lake Canyon here to the north, that's roughly 25 sheep. Uh, the Washakie Rim complex right here is roughly 50 to 55 to 70 sheep. It was a few more a few years ago, but it has since declined. Overall, this population's been relatively stable, but declining. 
here in recent years. Uh, the North Fork Papogia portion is about 10 to 15. Uh, interestingly, there were a couple of large wildfires, one here in the Bull Lake area um, to the north that uh, occurred in 2012 and we saw a commensurate increase in sheep there. Same with the Washakie Rim area, there was a large wildfire in 2004, we saw an increase in sheep there. Um, as far as lamb ratios, the last four years or so, it's ranged from 10 to 27 with an average of 21. Um, some of the other obvious issues that we have related to this herd, we have some pretty high uh, feral horse use on winter range in that Washakie Rim area in particular. Uh, cheatgrass is common to all the winter ranges, uh, some more than others. But that's also an issue that's also exacerbated by uh, excessive feral horse use, in particular around that Washakie Rim area. <clears throat> there are some human interaction issues in Sinks Canyon, although there are no sheep there now, but as far as uh, the future is concerned, um, that could be one potential issue. There's a lot of climbing in that Sinks Canyon area. Um, the last other issue is um, we have several small hobby flocks of domestic sheep in that North Fork Papogia area. Um, one thing, Stan, could you go to the next slide, please? So just lastly, uh, just quickly, I'll, I'll talk about some of the disease testing that we did in, in concert with Game and Fish, and that was in 1617 when we did this last uh, capture effort. We captured 26 sheep uh, in 16, indicated by the blue column in the table there. You can see that the, the herd was relatively clean. We didn't have an, any MOV uh, in 2017 that, that flipped. So it appeared that we were in an outbreak. Uh, we did have a couple of sheep die in hand, one in hand, one the next day post capture, uh, both from pneumonia. Um, we did see a decrease in population. Uh, we had a high of 92 in 2017, just before we documented that outbreak. And then in the follow-up in 2019, we still had 70 sheep in the population. So we didn't have a large decline, but uh, obviously a decline. Um, Stan, am I missing anything here? No, just some of the historic domestic sheep uh, issues in Sinks Canyon and probably occurred in other parts of the herd unit as well as on the reservation um, over the course of decades. Um, definitely a little bit of an issue again back to the, the hobby flocks down low. We've had a uh, young ram migrated all the way down Sinks Canyon, Middle Fork of the Papoja River all the way to the town limits, almost to City Park, and joined with a um, group of domestic sheep there. So there's interactions uh, that have been known and, and suspected over time, uh, just in these foothill ranges, uh, just along the Lander foothills, and I'm sure some of that could occur all the way from here toward Dubois, um, just one of those scenarios. Um, trying to keep my dog quiet here. The uh, other thing is that there were uh, the study that was done in 1994, VHF collars deployed in the Sinks Canyon and North Fork Canyon areas. Um, there were a pretty dispersed uh, set of bighorn sheep from those areas uh, to the south and west um, up into higher elevations then. We have had very minimal, uh, even when Sinks Canyon uh, population was blinking out, they were basically a resident population, much like the North Fork Proposia uh, Canyon population is now. We've got about 10 to 20 sheep there, uh, 12 documented last November, the day before Thanksgiving. But there is a little bit of an interchange uh, potential between those canyons. So test and removal in, for instance, the North Fork Canyon probably would be relatively easy because they're pretty much a resident population, but there's that risk of movements uh, of replacement animals to and from the, the Washakie Rim population that could end up, if we don't do it in both places, are we gonna be beating ourselves against the proverbial stump trying to figure out what, what to do to prevent that, so. 
the last thing I would mention just uh, from the Washakie Ram portion, um, any kind of uh, ground darting would be would be challenging. It would be it's doable, but I think it would be challenging. Um, you know, probably helicopter effort in that Washakie Rim area would be uh, the most likely scenario. Do you have uh, strain types on the MOB from the 2017? Um, yeah, I, question for I did Edward. not. Yeah, I did not have access to that. But Hank, if you can speak to that. Uh, Francis, we do not have those strain typed from um, this particular herd. We do from whiskey, of course, uh, but not the Temple Peak uh, subunit. Okay, thanks. I, the uh, two things I thought would might be interesting is, is it the same strain as whiskey? And also, is there more than one strain in there? This is a relatively low priority uh, herd unit or population from the state standpoint because of uh, the low populations we've had and the lack of uh, hunting season, but it doesn't mean it couldn't become a priority if we had a way to uh, reduce or eliminate the disease issues and, and reestablish populations in places where uh, we feel like they would be fit to do so. Yeah, I think there's great potential to increase the population here because the, certainly the habitat is there both winter range and, uh, and summer range for, uh, for much of the area. Um, as far as the tribal interest, um, tribal folks are very interested in, in bighorn sheep, especially the Eastern Shoshone because part of their culture derived from the sheep eater culture. Um, so there's definitely an, an importance there, but uh, like Stan mentioned, we have not had any harvest on the, on the reservation with this particular herd. There are three other herds where harvest is occurring. So um, it's, uh, it's a lower priority, I would say, from, a, from a, a management and harvest standpoint, for sure. Are you all in to uh, finish with your, per your presentation? We can kind of open it up to general comments. I am. Okay. Because um, we do have a question from Kevin Hurley. Dan, Pat, hey, uh, I think something worth sharing with the participants here from both Greg's standpoint and from this Temple Peak is, you know, the Pinedale side of the winds <coughs> had thousands of domestic sheep on it until the last 10 to 12 years. And so those have now gone away. And I think that's been hugely beneficial. Um, I just wanted to put that out there so folks understood some of that history, because I think there was probably a lot of contact through the decades along the crest of the winds. The other question I had, Pat, you know, focusing on that feral horseshoes around Washakie Rim, do the tribes, and I realize that you know, BIA, Fish and Wildlife Service is all interior, but can the tribes take action with all those feral horses above and on Washakie Rim without having to jump through some of the same hoops that say the BLM would have to? Curious if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, Kevin, could you repeat that question? I got bumped off and I just got reconnected. And so not sure. What yeah, I was just asking, you know, with BIA, Fish and Wildlife Service all being in the interior, my question is, do the tribes have greater flexibility to deal with that feral horseshoe so on Washakie Rim um, where they're not necessarily held to the 71 Horse and Burrow Act? Language. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Kevin. And uh, currently, the, the tribes are doing 
uh, roundup and removal of feral horses on the reservation. I, I've been pushing for that Washakie Rim area as a, as a primary target. There was some effort done this winter. Um, it wasn't terribly successful. It's all ground related work right now that they're doing. Um, they haven't had the funds to do helicopter gather, which would be required in that Washakie Rim area, I think. And so, but that's, that's coming. So um, there's groundwork that's been laid for horse removal. And, and I think it's in time with additional funds, we'll be able to get some horses removed from there. Thanks. Did um, Mike Cox or Emily want to re-ask their questions from the last presentation since we're still technically in Wyoming? I, this is Emily. Um, I was just gonna comment that, you know, we've done some simulation modeling to explore the intensity of test and remove um, that would be necessary to have an effect on pathogen extinction and my, we've modeled it a little differently than sort of the traditional implementation where you test two years in a row and identify those that, you know, consistently test positive and remove only those. In the, in the model we've worked with, we just assume you go in one year, test everybody, anyone who tests positive, you remove. Under that scenario, I think you still need to handle a fairly large portion of the herd to have, um, you know, a greater than 50% chance of, of initiating extinction. Um, so I think it is a, you know, real question. But that being said, if you have low prevalent, low chronic carriage, you could get lucky and you could knock out the, you know, the one chronic shutter that's, or a couple chronic shutters that are driving the dynamics locally. So I guess I would just reiterate that um, Francis's comment that we need more experimentation at different intensities to try and figure out what what works. Great. Um, Stan, unless you are going to refer back to your slide, do you want to stop screen sharing? There you go. Thank you. I didn't know if there were going to be more questions relevant to that herd, so. Mike, did you did you want to um, did you have a question? Well, I, I I typed in a question to Greg, but I'll shoot it to now Stan and Pat too. What is the limiting factor for a summer helicopter capture for these high elevation herds? Is it wilderness? Is it tree cover? Is it tribal approval needed? What what, what is it? Um, yeah, so this is Greg again. It would be uh, a wilderness issue. And the Forest Service has actually been a uh, really helpful partner with the Whiskey Herd over the years. But, and we have approval to do some helicopter wilderness captures. And in fact, they did some earlier this winter over on the west side of the Continental Divide associated with the Whiskey Herd. Um, and so we have approval on the BT to do that. We have approval to do it in portions of the wilderness area on the east side of the Continental Divide within the Shoshone National Forest. So, but yeah, that's really the limiting factor as far as getting hands on those high elevation sheep effectively, you know, other than, you know, one or two here on the ground and one or two five miles away on the ground. And I, I will tell you again, the Forest Service has been a great partner with that, but they are really getting owly about multiple wilderness capture approvals. We've gone to them for bear captures, um, goat captures, sheep captures, and more recently they've been subject to some litigation over wilderness operations as they've kind of ramped up these approvals for um, wilderness work. So. Um, I don't envision that loosening up in the future, but that's sort of crystal balling what the Forest Service has going on. Um, it, we, we work closely with them and, you know, our, our local Forest Service folks are doing everything they can 
But uh, yeah, limitations at the national level as far as motorized operations within the wilderness, including helicopter captures, uh, are really difficult to get carte blanche approval. And to do a substantial amount of that associated with test and remove would be a, a big hill to climb, I think. Not, not impossible, but yep, a, a serious logistical challenge. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it took me two years to get approval to capture two wilderness areas in Nevada. Perry, Perry was part of that. Um, it was painful, <laughs> but um, we stayed on point. We reached out to our advocates um, to get their involvement and to weigh in to say, and they, they were wilderness advocates. Yeah. And they said, you know what? Bighorn sheep is an important component to the wilderness experience. Um, and, and, you know, there's other states, California has been successful, um, Colorado, and I think maybe collectively we could help, um, if, if anything else, browbeat, um, you know, a different forest to say, look, uh, wilderness is wilderness and we're, we're making a go. Uh, we're, we're trying to minimize obviously impacts, but um, it's, yeah. it's happening, so. Uh, well, I, I will tell you from our standpoint, should we decide to attempt any type of operation within that whiskey herd, I have no doubt that it would be extremely helpful to have support from a Wafla type group and NGOs, uh, you know, mentioning to the Forest Service that, you know, this isn't a one-off thing, but if we attempted this with whiskey, it's something that everyone wants to learn from. That'd be extremely helpful. Yep. Well, let's, yeah, let's, let's keep speaking and certainly talk with, with Doug and Daryl and, uh, and Kevin with the Wild Sheep Foundation and we can reach out to get, get support from others to help you. You bet. Yeah, good, good thoughts. Yeah, Mike, I was just gonna add, uh, conversely um, from Whiskey, the Temple uh, Herd we don't have that same issue. You know, most of the sheep are wintering down low elevation on winter range. Um, so there isn't as much a concern to try to do any captures on summer range. I think they'd be more accessible on winter range. Yeah, that certainly would be the first alternative. Best. Yeah, that's, that seems doable. Yeah, and and some of those whiskey or washiki rim uh, area sheep from the reservation do migrate up to the wilderness uh, west of Lander. So we've had a similar scenario to what Greg has, uh, but yeah, quite a mixture of, of summer ranges on the, the Temple Peak side of things. Hey Mike, this is Greg again, and maybe to Francis as well, sort of follow up on Mike's thoughts. You know, hypothetically, let's say we had carte blanche approval to do wilderness captures up there, test and remove. Um, I'm assuming virtually everything we've been talking about has been winter captures. That's when these animals are, are probably most accessible to folks. What does, what does it mean to do summer captures? You know, we talked about intermittent shedding with these animals for mycoplasma. Any thoughts on summer test and removal? Again, thinking from a logistics standpoint, boy, the, that landscape that I showed you, the one picture in the winds, you can imagine how often you get to fly up there in the winter time, especially low elevation net gunning. Uh, it's stocked <laughs> in most of the time. And so summer would be the time to do that or fall. Yeah, I'd make sure the lambs were big enough, but um, if, they're, if, if you've got a chronic shedder, it's going to be shedding this summer, next fall, next spring, next summer. It, I think it might be better because, well, I'm assuming they're less concentrated in the summer than in the winter. Yeah, less concentrated overall, although someone made the point before where they said, it's not how many people are in your city, it's how many people are lined up at the bar. And of course, yeah, there's all... <laughs> land birds. Well, there's not. 50 of them together, but all eight U's are together for sure, you know, side by side. 
Yeah, there's still totally. going to be nursery groups. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was just, I don't know what the effect of uh, season would be, but um, no, it, you'd want to get them where, where they have the least um, amount, you have fewest intermittent shedders. And I guess somehow I thought that there would be more during the winter because they would just be more exposed to other positive sheep, but it sounds like I could see that the nursery groups are another uh, concentrated period too, so I don't know. It would be challenging just to capture at that altitude. Yeah, we were capturing at 11.5 in Nevada. Yeah, good for you. And that's really what we'd be talking here, anywhere from 11.5 to 12. Kevin? Question. And we heard Chris Proctor and Helen and Kylie talk about British Columbia's approach um, on the Fraser and elsewhere. And it sounds kind of harsh and I'm oversimplifying, but you know, one strike and you're out. And so for these animals that are extremely difficult to get to, high elevation, inaccessible, um, you're not gonna get a repeat sample of those. And so what you would need is a pretty reliable, not instantaneous, but a pretty real time result from a biomeme unit. And to me, if there's enough concern and this herd is whittled down from 2000 to 500 and on its way south, I just wonder if that shouldn't be a consideration um, in these kind of extreme backcountry high elevation type areas where you're only going to get one one try at that sheep. And if you get a positive and then go, hmm, crap, now we got to go back and do something with it or wait till it comes out of the wilderness. Uh, sounds harsher, but I guess I'd throw that out there for group discussion. I, you know, I, I that'll, really... that'll take us to the end. <clears throat> so go ahead, Mike. Well, I really appreciate two it. Two minutes to discuss. Chris and Helen and Kylie's approach. And I think we're going to be looking more at one strike you're out too. Um, and especially with the, the, the very narrow window you have to do the work, um, timing wise and, and administrative wise, um, it makes sense that you you go to one strike. But, you know, I, I agree with that, but I guess it would be good to talk more about how exactly the bio meme would work. Um, I mean, not right now, but if you, if that would be one of the components of the conversation. It's not like you just do it and, you know. Right, well, we could, we could have Kylie and Helen um, you know, have a separate meeting after this and, and have some people and have them explain and, and, uh, and others, you know, I mean, Caitlin with South Dakota State, and Dan Walsh would probably be more than willing to help participate. Thinking out of the box. That'll be our next workshop, Mike. Okay. Thank you, Wyoming, for sharing a lot of great information on those complicated herds. And we're now going to move south and west to Utah and Jessica Fort with the Navajo Nation and San Juan Canyon is going to speak to us about her situation or the situation in Utah. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Let's start screen sharing. Can everyone see this slide? Yes. Perfect. Looks okay. great. Yes. I'm Jess Ford, wildlife biologist with Navajo Nation Department of Fish and Wildlife. Also with us in the workshop is Nikki and David Stevens, and they have 
um, part of Stevens Wildlife Consulting. And they have been our contract uh, bighorn sheep biologists for over 20 years. And they are organizing and leading the test and remove project. So I'm just here to present. And then at the end, we'll, I'll probably defer a lot of the questions to the Stevens. So Navajo Nation is a huge area. It spans New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. All the, sh the sheep that we manage are mainly in the Utah region here. So we have um, our herds that we manage along the San Juan River, and then also on some of these canyon systems off of Lake Powell. So this is kind of zoomed into that box. Um, these are the three different herds that we manage. Um, and I've color coordinated them for the rest of the presentation. So in blue, we have Upper Canyon. In red, we have Lower Canyon, and those are separated by 163 and Mexican Hat, uh, the community of Mexican Hat. And then we have another herd all the way over on Lake Powell here, and that'll be in purple. And so the program has been going for about 20 years now. Um, and the main goal of the program has been to uh, expand the bighorn sheep populations in numbers to mimic historic numbers in distribution. And then the last couple of years, we've been focusing more on um, disease and, and herd health management. So just a quick overview of some of the transplants that have been done. Um, we started in 1998, there's about 34 sheep surveyed. So bighorn sheep were almost extirpated from Navajo Nation. Um, and then from there, uh, that was used as a source population to transplant 24 bighorn sheep to um, Lower Canyon in 2003. There's another transplant in Glen Canyon in 2008 of 30 sheep. A uh, third transplant of 20 sheep in 2010 in Lower Canyon. There was um, 20 sheep that were given to Arizona Given Fish for People's Canyon. And then another transplant of 14 sheep in 2015 to Glen Canyon. And all these transplants were done um, when MOV was not detected. So currently what we have going on, um, and the collars that we use are all telonics. We have a total population of about 400. In Glen Canyon, we have about 300 as a population estimate. Lower Canyon um, has decreased all the way down to 30 and I'll show population trends in the next slide. And then right now we have about 70 in Upper Canyon herd. So over time, we've had pretty steep declines in Lower Canyon and Upper Canyon herds. And this is our population data from 2007 to 2020. Um, and then this is our recruitment data. This is our land to you ratios. So you can see that Lower Canyon has had really steep crashes in population and then also in Upper Canyon. And you see down here, um, our recruitment crashed all the way to zero in 2015 in Lower Canyon. Um, and so we believe, and after testing, we believe that MOV was introduced into Lower Canyon um, between about 2013 and 2014. We believe it was then uh, introduced into Upper Canyon from between 2015 and 16, and then Glen Canyon in 2016 and 2017. Um, these population trends, the Lower and Upper Canyon were taken in June. Glen Canyon was taken in May, and then you do see here the triangles. I just indicated that those, um, those land view ratios were taken in October, so maybe that explains some of the decline here, but probably not all of the decline. So Amobi prevalence, um, there was, Amobi was tested in 2010 with one of those captures. Um, 21 sheep were tested and we found zero prevalence in 2010. Then they were tested again in 2018. We tested 47 total. And then you can see the breakdown of how many sheep per population were tested. And we had a really high prevalence in Lower Canyon. Um, we had a pretty high prevalence in Upper and then a lower prevalence in Glen Canyon. And then in 2020, um, we captured 90 sheep and 89 samples went through for MOB PCR. Um, and we found a prevalence of 50 in Lower Canyon, 31% in Upper Canyon, and then 4% in Glen Canyon. And so this is percent inhibition for MOV ELISA testing. Um, and you can see they're color coordinated. So Glen Canyon um, and this 50% line is, is uh, antibodies detected over 50%. 
So you can see that our lower and upper canyon have a lot higher antibody presence than Glen Canyon. And then all three populations have a higher uh, antibody prevalence um, the second year in 2020 that they were tested. We also in 2018 and 2020 sent um, samples off for strain typing. And we have had data sharing agreements with Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and Utah State University. We've also recent, uh, reached out to Arizona Game and Fish, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and New Mexico Game and Fish, but those last three, we didn't have any matches, strain typing matches. Um, we only had them in sheep in Utah. So there was some inconsistencies over the, the two times that we've strain typed. So what we believe is going on is there is a shared strain between Lower and Upper Canyon. Um, there is a unique strain in Lower Canyon, um, and these two are very genetically similar. And then there is a third strain that is very genetically dissimilar that's found in Glen Canyon. And we did find that strain one and three had matches in Utah. I haven't been able to get permission from um, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources to uh, release those herds, so I'm not gonna release them here, but um, they, were, they were matches in Utah. And here's some of the other diseases that we've tested for over the three, the last three captures. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but that's the prevalence over the years. And then some of the isolates from the cultures that we've, that we've gotten in our results at the bottom here. And then here's some of the uh, treatments and vaccinations that we've given to our sheep over time which have fluctuated over the years due to different um, wildlife veterinary, veterinarians that have been consulted on the projects. Um, so one of the things that we are considering is the importance of identifying disease reservoirs. Um, so domestic sheep herding is an incredibly important tradition and practice for Navajo people. Um, it's been uh, an important food source for hundreds of years. The wool is also used um, for clothing and to weave Navajo rugs, which is incredibly traditionally important. Um, and then also on the other side of that, bighorn sheep are also very important animals to Navajo people. They're, they're seen as very powerful animals. Um, for example, when we plug our, our rams, our harvested rams, we save the shavings from the plugs and those are donated out to sheep herders and medicine men that burn them around the domestic sheep. And it's believed that that power from the uh, bighorn sheep is transferred to their domestic sheep, like vitality and health. Um, so it's, it's an important consideration for us, the cultural aspect of bighorn sheep and domestic sheep management. So we have two different projects coming up, considering the disease prevalence and how it's impacted our herds and the cultural relevance of domestic sheep herding. Um, we know that there is contact between domestic sheep and bighorn sheep. Um, we have had to euthanize a ram a couple years ago because it was trying to mate with domestic ewes. Um, we know it's happening, ram forays out contacting domestic sheep herds. We just don't know how often and how important that is to actual disease transmission. We also know our bighorn sheep are crossing river and there is contact with Utah sheep because we have the, the, the strain matches. So one of the projects we're working on right now is we uh, have a, um, we'd like to have a Navajo master's or PhD student come in and kind of explore um, domestic sheep husbandry and practices to kind of understand that aspect of the problem. Um, so right now we have a pilot study going on this summer and we have a undergraduate Navajo student that's working on it. Um, we're also seeking funding uh, for tuition and stipend for her in the future to turn this into a master's or PhD project. And she's right now going around and she is mapping active sheep allotments on Navajo Nation. Um, and she, of those people that are herding sheep, if they want to participate in the study, she'll, she'll proceed in surveying them to understand husbandry practices. Um, are they seasonally herding their sheep? Um, or are they more static year round? Um, are there local water sources that the domestic sheep and bighorn sheep are sharing? We have remote cameras we can put up on those uh, water sources as well. Um, we also want to test the domestic sheep of the herders that want to participate in the study, and we do PCR lies and strain typing. <clears throat> we have um, collars that we'd like to put out in some of these herds to see exactly where they're moving and what their seasonal movements look like. And then we also are looking at the possibility of using the rate of contact tool from US, um, 
for service. And that's one thing that maybe we could use as a discussion point. Um, would that be a good tool for us to use if anybody has any uh, opinions or suggestions on, on using that tool? And then um, we'd also like to include as a postdoc or part of the PhD position looking at climate change prediction models um, because all wildlife in Navajo Nation has been severely impacted by drought, um, extended drought over the years. So we want to see how that impacts um, population viability over time. And then to the test and remove project. So um, Stevens Wildlife Consulting will be leading this project. They want to focus on oops, the upper and lower canyon down here um, because those are, have been more severely impacted. Um, all of the capture will be done through net gunning. Some of this, most of the terrain is really, really difficult and inaccessible. And we've always used net gunning to capture in the past. So the first capture, um, would be November, December this year. And keep in mind that we have disease results for sheep that we captured in um, 2018 and 2020. So these would be ewes that are already marked, would be recaptured in November and December and tested for MOV. We'd also try and capture all new ewes that, that aren't marked um, and those would also be tested as well. Um, and then all those that are captured that don't already have, that are already marked with collars will be deployed with VHF collars. So the second capture remove is planned for next year, January, 2020. In this, we plan to capture all the use that tested positive twice in any one of those three captures that we've already done. And then um, the, the use that are chronic shutters that test uh, positive twice will be removed. And then we have the issue of the ewes that are only captured for the first time this December and November capture coming up. We're thinking um, of removing those. So that's another discussion point as well is some of these will only have one test. Um, so we would proceed with removing them if they only have one positive test. So another potential discussion point. Um, we're seeking labs that want these MOV positive desert bighorn use. Um, so any suggestions for that, any labs that are seeking um, MOV positive sheep that would be willing to take ours. And if we can't find a lab available, they'll be euthanized and necropsy after capture. Our evaluation metrics um, would be monitoring lamb survival and recruitment as the Stevens have done every year in upper and lower canyon. And then obviously population size change over time. Another discussion point of seeing other uh, presentations would be, do we need to test lambs as well? Is that suggested for um, part of the evaluation metrics that we would use? Um, so some of the acknowledgements and our funding sources, and I would like to say for this past capture in the domestic sheep, part of the study, we're partnering with Denver Zoological Foundation and Colorado State University. Um, Here's our contact information in case we don't get all the questions uh, during our discussion. Um, and yeah, I'd like to open up for questions. Great, thank you, Jess. Okay, hey, Kevin. Hurley. Yes, this is Kevin. Um, I'll I'll help you get in touch with the right folks on that risk of contact modeling. Um, so I've got a note to myself, and I just sent off a text. But let's follow up on that afterwards. We can we can work with you on that one. Great, thank you. Kara, you've got a raised hand from Francis and from oh, Mike. Here we go. Oh my God, they're coming in like mad now. Okay. Thank you, Kezia. Francis. Uh, that looks really great, Jess. Thanks for that presentation. Um, yeah, I think you should uh, definitely plan on testing some lambs as a part of your evaluation. Follow up. And I was also wondering how many, you probably said it, but I, how many positives did you have in the first, between the first 
couple tests. I can go back to that slide. Um, Sorry. Oh, that's fine. So this is the prevalence um, of the three different times that we've tested for MOV. And it differed so much between the herds that I didn't want to put just a general prevalence over the three herds. Yeah. So when it says n equals 10, that means that was the number you sampled or the number that were positive? Sorry, the number that were sampled. Okay. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's... Mike, you had a question? Yeah, Jess, uh, great presentation. And sounds like you've got a really good plan laid out. What is the distance to the nearest desert bighorn herd that's positive um, in the canyon that Utah Division of Wildlife Resources manages? Um, it's it's pretty close. Um, Nikki, I don't know if you want to come in here, but um, it's right north of Lower Canyon. I don't want to release the actual canyon name without or the herd name without permission. I don't know if that's allowed, but uh, it's pretty close, and it's yeah. Have you um, reached out to them in terms of them maybe doing a companion? um effort at the same time so we are in communication with utah division wildlife resources i was talking to annette Rug. um i think she might have left though because i got an email saying that she was no longer with the department but we have reached out yeah, they're, yeah they're they're very interested in in collaborating so we do have a data sharing agreement with them and so um yeah we wanted to propose what we were thinking to this workshop first and then proceed from there with people's suggestions. Excellent, yeah. Okay, um, Charlie? Yeah, hi Jess, this is Charlie Kelly. Hey, um, I enjoyed your presentation, it was very informative. I was wondering if funding is holding you guys back on some of the studies you guys are trying to conduct, or are you have you got adequate funding secured to do the testing and stuff that you'd like to do? So we definitely could use more funding, absolutely. Um, in terms of the domestic sheep study, we're, we're seeking funding for the whole thing, pretty much for, for the entire project. For the test and remove, we have funding up until the actual removal. So we have funding for the first capture um, and then the removal capture will need to seek funding. And we do have some funding available within the department, but we would love to have external funding for some of this. So we're open to any possibilities. Okay, well, I've got some ideas. We're limited on time. I'll reach out to you and uh, Jeff Cole, thank you. Great, thank you. Perry, do we have any more time or do we need to move on here? No, we have 11 minutes left in this session. Awesome. So I wanted to raise something. Um, Paige Prentice asked a question a bit ago, and I thought this might be a good um, point to talk a little bit more generally about strategies for how to implement test and remove in desert herds. Um, you know, do you, like, I think this maybe dovetails on some of the previous questions about the potential for summer capture, um, or, you know, how do you, you know, kind of what is the strategy for getting this done? And so I wonder, Jess, if you could kind of speak to that, like, tactically, how you guys have thought about that, or, or Nikki or whomever, um, and then I, it would be interesting to hear from other um, folks thinking about this for Desert Herds, just what considerations are coming up, if that's an okay way to use this time. Sure, I will give Nikki a chance. Um, Nikki, do you want to give your input here? I'm trying to go down to see if she's here. Um, so for our herd in particular, we always do our capture between November. We try to do it before March just because it gets so hot in the canyon. So that is something that we're trying to work around that's why we have the capture times as we had listed. Um, 
because it does get too hot. So we believe that it would just, it would be unhealthy <clears throat> to capture during the summer months because it gets, you know, 100 plus in some of those canyons. So it's one thing that we are limited in. That's something that we have to consider with the lamb capture, how we're going to do that um, in terms of time. But yeah, for us, for the adults, we're, we are limited to capturing during the winter months. And for us in particular, we, we would do it net gunning because of the terrain is, is so difficult and so inaccessible. I think, how old are the lambs when you catch the adults? So our lambing is uh, April through May. So that would be about seven months if we did it in November. So we could definitely yeah, we could capture, you know, a little bit older lambs for sure. If, if you guys think that would be. That would be, that would be better. Yeah, be good. Jess, would you mind, um, if, if we're not going specifically on these herds, maybe just minimize your screen or stop sharing so we yeah. can see everybody. Thank yeah. you. Kezia, in terms of Paige's question, you know, she was like, how do you decipher uh, what's th the cause of mortality? Is it pathogens or is it, there's no food out in the desert? Um, and, you know, obviously Jess and Stevens have clear data showing that they've got mycoplasma. So I think from that standpoint, uh, I think they're moving in the right direction. And we know that there's huge swings in the desert with production and recruitment, but um, to have mycoplasma laid on top of it, it's, it's not good. So I, I think they, they've got the data to support moving, moving forward with the test and remove. Yes, I think that's a good point. Oops. Now we can hear you, Paige, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually not nope, very well. still can't hear you. <laughs> mm, yeah, but don't move. <laughs> Okay, I think she was saying if they don't have the resources in California, how can they move forward um, if they don't think they can capture a large enough proportion of the population? And then I think there was also a question about teasing out the drought versus the um, other, you know, other causes, disease causes of uh, mortality. But that's what I heard. Okay, these these questions for us. Well, I think we we're just going to sort of general uh, questions now, unless there were specific ones that were were addressing your situation. But it sounds like the everyone feels that you've got a great grasp on it, and we're we're looking forward to hearing the results. <laughs> Yeah, that was broad for the group. Yeah. You know, I'm not aware of a test and remove that's been initiated on a desert herd. 
we're 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 kicking it around here in Nevada. We've got plenty of herds that are um, in the teens, single digits. When even with drought, they're they're averaging twenty five to thirty long term, but we just haven't got around to pulling the trigger. So Mike, for those herds, like when would you do it? Well, I think we'd, we'd, we, we normally do our captures in late October, November, if we're gonna move them. So, um, but um, we are considering maybe going a little earlier um, to try to capture them when they don't have their coat, their winter coats. But yeah, I'd, I'd say for, a lower canyon like the Navajo Nation is stick with that in that November period for sampling and, and removal. Yeah, Paige is asking, Mike, what was the, oh, that was more my point. It doesn't seem like states are looking at desert bighorns yet. I'm curious what the reasons are and if you would do anything, and if you do, would you be doing anything different? Well, I can tell you the one herd we're considering, and I, I think Joe Bennett's on the call. Uh, you know, our, our desert herds are just so scattered um, because of the resource limitations out there that it, it logistically adds another layer of complexity. You don't have these nice um, nursery groups sometimes um, or if you do, you've got huge amount of use on a water development, which, you know, drop nets um, could, could come into play if you're able to um, utilize them. But yeah, I mean, we, we're all struggling, whether it's Utah, California, Nevada, Arizona, we all have herds that are succumbing, you know, lamb, long-term lamb mortality. We're just behind the times, I guess. We need to get our yeah. act together. This is Ann with, with Arizona Game and Fish, and I know a couple other folks from our department are on. I think, as Mike already alluded to, one of the big issues is we've got some really spread out groups. Um, the most recent one that we had a real definitive outbreak in was in the Black Mountains, and that that population, I know it has some substructure, but it extends from, you know, the very far eastern Arizona or north, western Arizona, Nevada border, all the way down, almost halfway down the extent of the state. Um, and it, it, the population has numbered in the several hundreds for sure. We have a couple of areas where we've considered it. I think accessibility is another big issue. Um, one of our populations that struggled for a long time is in the Kanab Creek area just off the Grand Canyon. And um, that's one area we've talked about considering it. Um, but I, I think accessibility is one of the issues. It's bordering right on wilderness, obviously bordering right on the national park. Um, and it, it would be a, a real challenge. You know, we had a a pretty significant mortality many years ago in the COFA and those guys have now finally recovered. So I think part of it is also history. I and mean, we've got populations that are MOV positive that are actually doing quite well. And I think this, you know, whether or not there's actually a real need to get in there. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with strain type, previous history, you know, what other resources they have and that sort of thing. And I think to just kind of echo on top of that, that it's certainly in that Southern Nevada, California, uh, Arizona area, it was, um, I think, pretty amazing how quickly that, that spread, uh, that new strain spread throughout that whole subpopulation. And it would be, you know, all of those herds seem interconnected and spread out. So it would almost have to be a, you know, massive effort because if we just took care of one, 
the way it with the way it spread so quickly, it would be a, a short matter of time before it was in, I think before it was infected again. Agreed. Judging from what we saw. Agreed. I mean, and we've got multiple strain types circulating in some of those areas. I in in the COFA, I've got like three strain types that I've identified. So it's kind of an ongoing issue, connectivity issue. Okay, we are uh, ready to move on. Thank you. That was an excellent um, presentation. And we are now um, going back up to Washington. And uh, Kristen Mansfield, who is the wildlife veterinarian with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think is gonna do this presentation. Kristen, are you with us here? Yeah, um, I actually okay. told Chris actually, I jumped Will in. Will Moore is going to oh. give the talk. Okay, oh. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so William, I William, well, you, you're an expert at, at sharing your PowerPoint, so. <laughs> uh, well, we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> We're not seeing it yet. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. I think that's working. Yes, it is. Thank you. All right. I, I, am, I am an expert, so. Uh, <laughs> So uh, my name is William Moore and I'm an ungulate specialist with uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I've worked on, with bighorn sheep for probably about 15 years in the Yakima Canyon, um, uh, Yakima, Kittitas County areas. And so now I've been working with bighorn sheep across the state. Uh, my situation's a little bit different than the ones you've been seeing just because we're going to look at a couple herds that are um, newly infected and uh, and I think the question that we, I want you to kind of think about as we move through this is, you know, how do we move forward with um, continued risk that may be still there um, and that we might not be able to actually alter. So the first herd that I want to chat, with, chat about is the um, Mount Hall herd. It is in north central Washington. And you can see the inset map there on the um, lower left. And basically, it's right on the border with um, British Columbia. And so the Mount Hall herd is in light blue there. It's the middle herd in the map. Uh, British Columbia also has a herd, has multiple herds that are to the north. And then we also have a herd to the south with the Confederated, Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. And that's the Omac Lake herd. The uh, Mount Hall herd is right around 90 sheep. And British Columbia, I believe in their multiple herds, herds are running around five to 600, where the Colville herd is about 50. Um, in January of 2019, we documented a MOVI in the Mount Hall herd. The initial die off was pretty mild. Um, the population has been relatively stable. Uh, lamb survival post-infection has dropped to about eight per one, eight uh, lambs per 100 ewes. It's normally running about 25 per 100. We actually did our first round of testing in 2020 with a, a collaborative effort between um, the Colvilles and WDFW. Uh, on specifically the Mount Hall herd, we had eight of the 12 were positive in serology and the PCR was three of 12 were positive. So, we're not quite sure where this has come from, but, um, but we have domestic sheep that are right on the border. You can see those um, populations, the domestic areas in red, and those are a continual problem. We know that we have um, movement from British Columbia back and forth to Mount Hall. Um, we have a documented ram that was collared that has moved back and forth. Um, We've tested for, uh, 
for strain typing in the Mount Hall herd and have the same strain as what they have in British Columbia. And so um, right now, as of right now, we're kind of trying to, well, we collared and tested in 2020. Our goals right now is to collar and monitor movements between the two herds and then um, continue to coordination, a coordinated effort amongst all the managing agencies. Uh, we obviously want to attempt to, we've, we've attempted to try to deal with the private domestics situation, but we haven't been successful there. And, um, you know, in these herds, in this herd specifically, you know, trapping is not going to be too difficult for us. Uh, we have a corral trapping option. I'm guessing we could probably get a, our hands on a large proportion of the, of the population. And, um, and uh, could potentially do helicopter captures for the rest. So, you know, obviously we have control over our herds. We don't have control over everybody else's. And so, you know, we, we're going, we're walking in this with continual risk. Um, if, if, even if we were able, were able to get the domestics out of that area. If we move to the next herd, it's kind of a similar situation. My PowerPoint's not moving forward. There we go. So we have a kind of similar situation with the Clemens herd that was recently infected in 2020. Um, this is one herd with kind of a split home range. It runs about 200 in the lower, uh, one that's to the southeast, and about 25 to 35 in the one that's to the northwest. As you can see, it's right there in the middle of central Washington. It's right next to the, it's, it's pretty close to the Yakima. Um, canyon herd. It was close to the Tyatan herd as well. It's a herd that we've used heavily um, for uh, translocating animals. We probably have translocated an, uh, hundreds of animals out of this herd over the last 20 years. It, um, then the, we found Moby in the herd in October of 2020. The initial die-off again was mild lambs and rams. The ewe numbers have remained fairly stable so far. Lamb survival has dropped um, to about 17 per 100. It's normally right around 31 per 100. And we have a um, domestic grazing allotments of, of, of sheep that are in close proximity to the herd. And so over the last 20 years, we have had no um, outbreaks of Moby in the herd, although we've had this domestic situation of, of grazing allotments sitting right on top of the herd basically. The, the population to the Northwest, about 25 to 35, is fairly new, maybe in the last 10 years or so. And you can see these, um, these grazing allotments, the Menashe Tash has a, a pretty high risk of contact at 0.398 per year. The Nile um, grazing allotment intersects that Northwestern portion of the population. And the Rattlesnake allotment uh, has a risk of contact of a 0.993 per year. Um, right now, we're still working with the Forest Service and providing input to their grazing management alternatives. Um, we're doing some testing uh, via hunter harvested animals. We've increased our ram harvest to try to, you know, give people opportunities to harvest and while bringing down the population. Um, we'll continue our population monitoring. Uh, corral trapping is definitely um, an option here. And so I guess the big question for the group, I mean, is that some of these situations aren't, I mean, you know, ho we're hoping to improve our situation with risk of contact, but at what point, you know, do you say you're not going to move forward or you will move forward even though you have given a risk? So. So that's kind of the question to uh, the other managers. I'm sure other managers have dealt with these situations where they have, um, you know, herds that still have risk, have contact with other sheep that may have a Moby. And, uh, you know, right now, I think we're in a holding pattern. We're not quite sure if we're going to move forward with test and remove. I mean, we're obviously going to try to move forward with reducing risk, but, you know, that's an unknown for us right now. So.
Okay, so, I'm yeah. not a manager. Anybody but have any thoughts? <laughs> anybody I'll have any just, thoughts? I'll just uh, go out on a limb. <laughs> uh, I guess you have to solve the problem that caused the um, you know, caused the outbreak in the first place, and or at least be addressing it. You know, I've had the, I just have had the same thought about doing test and remove in Hell's Canyon because there's lots of blocks private. You know, with the the we don't have the problem with the public lands grazing, but we do have private um, sheep and goat owners, mostly goat owners, and. Um, you know, I guess I would say, and we were, we're trying to address that, and I would feel really uncomfortable doing test remove without addressing uh, a new spillover. You know, if you, especially if you have an idea of that's where it came from. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, the, I mean, we, we suspect that, obviously, but, yeah, you know, we don't know where that's came from, where, it, you know, it came from domestic somewhere. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's just kind of a, a tough situation because you, you know, we don't know if we can get this to be, you know, a perfect situation. And uh, what, you know. Well, you can't get it to yeah. be, I mean, <laughs> you're a manager. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, at what point do you oh. say, okay, for, I mean, for example, like this Clemens Mountain herd, I mean, it went on for 20 years without being infected and was in, and was in an, actually a situation worse than this and had a grazing allotment just to the north of the Nile. And so, you know, I mean, if, since it's such easy trapping, you know, we could probably do test and remove fairly easily. And, you know, maybe we can get the population rebound and get 10 years out of it or 15 years or who knows, you don't really know, you know, so. Anyhow, that was my situation and that's where we're at with those two herds, so. Well, this is Mike. Um, I sometimes don't follow my own advice <laughs> and I dream a lot. And we, we have a herd um, which was highlighted in the Wild and Wool documentary. Unfortunately, because of its poor performance and lambs dying every year, and we, we talked amongst ourselves in Nevada. We, talked with our Utah counterparts and we've we've been trying to reach out to the wool growers which we know the likely spillover source but we have not completely addressed that's that um, source but we we did start um, kind of a passive test and remove last summer and um, I think some of us are just hoping that there's going to be some synergy, some impetus that could push our agencies to work more with the permittees and the BLM. And so, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll admit that uh, I, I, we probably shouldn't have until you get the, the problem with the spillover source dealt with. It's yeah. tough. Yeah. Because when you see these lambs die every year, it's just, man, it's just hard. Right. I think Kevin has a question. Hey, Will, I've got a two part question if I can. So that shot that's on the screen right now, um, of course, the judge declined the preliminary injunction, but is DFW here in any? guesstimate or timetable when a judge's ruling might happen on the larger question of those four service allotments? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, we haven't heard. And then back up one slide, if you would, Will. So those two private deals, um, one northwest of Omac Lake and the other one, Mount Hull, to your knowledge, has there been conversation with those private owners or um, did that bear fruit or did they just say, hell no? 
Yeah. So yeah. So the one in the, I know in the one in um, Mount Hall for sure. Ha there's been conversations, and you know they've said no to testing their domestics, and they've said no to a fencing program. And I think it really came down to them having to sign a a contract with WDFW for the fencing program. So. Uh huh. And so that's where the holdups have been on that one. You know, and so, I mean, so then you make the question like, well, if we were able to get that taken care of, is that good enough? Or, you know, I mean, or, I mean, ultimately we would love to be able to work collaboratively amongst all three and, you know, successfully do test and remove across all three, all two, British Columbia and us, you know, but it's hard to say if that's going, how that's going to work out. So. Yeah, and I'd echo what Francis said, you know, you sort of have to address the problem first before you yeah try new things yep <clears throat> well if that's it that's fine by me and uh, you guys can use probably extra time for some other discussions so thank you will no other questions or discussion um, Bill Jex had a comment yeah. in the chat, yeah. um, just noting um, that he would recommend weighing out the risks. If you think the potential for reinfection from the domestics post-test and remove is low, then why not try it if you have public support and money? If you did the work and then there was reinfection, it likely would generate some added public interest, which ultimately might help as well. And I don't know, um, Bill, if you want to speak further on that, but... Yeah, it's, a, it's just a thought, right? I mean, I look at the boundaries for that OMAC herd that's on Will's map versus the Mount Hall group and, you know, the OMAC one versus the private domestic stuff. There's some separation there. Maybe there's a better um, success opportunity for that group uh, versus the Mount Hall group. But regardless, you know, if you've, if you've got political will to do something, then doing something might pay dividends even though you have a reinfection later. Great, thank you for the comment. I, I, yeah, I think we'll have to weigh that in as we go through with our decision-making on this, so. Okay. Um, if there, we have a, a couple of ways we could do this. We could start with our next group. Maybe that's the best thing to do. And then if there are questions, um, pick up remaining chat questions at the end, if we have some time. Now that William's got us way ahead of time, we're doing well. So do we want to move to Oregon and Nevada and the Santa Rosas? Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Perry. I'm going to introduce our team. Uh, we're going to talk about this interstate herd and ask all of you to give us advice. Um, Rob Spawn is going to run the PowerPoint presentation. Rob is a PhD candidate for Oregon State University. Um, he's riding up in going to defend here hopefully shortly. He had uh, some great field seasons that we've all, both states have taken advantage of to use, use his data and um, the information that he gained. His uh, dissertation is impacts of MOVI on patterns of demography and space use in uh, bighorn sheep in southeastern Oregon and northern Nevada. Uh, the other two uh, presenters are Ed Partee. He's a game biologist for us, Nevada Department of Wildlife. Been in his job for uh, over 20 years and uh, is very knowledgeable about the herd we're going to talk to and uh, has the majority of our California bighorn sheep herd in the state. And then um, kind of his counterpart in Oregon is Scott Torland. And Scott is an assistant district uh, biologist, uh, been in that position for about 15 years. 
So we're hoping to kind of tag team throughout the slides. And looks like Rob has it um, prepped. So I guess we'll go to uh, slide two. So take it away, Ed. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, just a little bit of background for the Santa Rosa population. Um, we have probably about five different little subherds within that mountain range um, that have expanded over the years. Um, that, that slide kind of shows kind of the, the population of those, those little subherds at this point, and they're all on a downward trend. Um, and Dorno Peterman, that's that's a good one to remember for for later on in this presentation and later on today. Um, Calicos, uh, that's kind of on the east side of the Santa Rosas, Calico Mountains, eight miles more towards the north end of the range, closer to the Oregon border. Martin Creek is kind of in the middle, kind of centralized, and then Sawtooth is kind of between that area of Eight Mile and Andorno. Um, all of these populations at one time had fairly large numbers um, of, of sheep and we just see constant um, lamb recruitment either completely failing or there's years that we might get some decent recruitment but it's just pretty much remained stable in a lot of these areas or is decreasing for the most part. And I'll let, I'll let Scott talk about the Oregon stuff. Sure, and, and it's pretty similar to what uh, Ed just said. You know, we've got uh, really two, kind of three herds um, in, the Oregon side, which are really tied into the uh, Santa Rosas along a similar fault block line. So we've got the Ralph State Cowden herd, but you know, 50 to you know, 75 animals in there, and it's a, it's been a declining part. And then the 10 mile herd, um, it's a you know, smaller habitat area, but it's Never really supported any more Scott, than 50 animals, I'd say. And, and, and like Ed said, we've had a boomer bust. Um, you know, oh, episode with with lamb recruitment. Oh, sorry, Perry. We might have tough internet said, connection here, so we can just roll on to the yeah. Head. So just a visual representation. Okay, it's just really hard to hear right. you. So this is just a visual representation of all the populations across southeastern Oregon and northern Nevada. Um, the populations to the west of Highway 95 indicated by the dash lines just indicate populations that um, haven't been exposed to either, uh, haven't been exposed to MOV whatsoever. Um, just north of DHP, which is the double H's, um, was the former Montana herd, but that's been eradicated and we'll discuss, we'll be discussed later. Um, yeah. Ed. So Rob, just... Me? Yes, yeah. Mark? Scott, go ahead and say something. You're still cutting out. But yeah, Rob, just reiterate the subherds that Ed and Scott talked about in terms of spatial distribution. Yeah, so um, in the Santa Rosas, you've got Eight Mile, um, Martin Creek, Calicos, Sawtooth, and then down in the southern portion there, you've got um, both Andornos and Peterman. And then in the far bottom right, you'll see uh, snowstorms, um, which will be discussed further. And then on the Oregon side, um, you've got Ten Mile, the southern bit there, and then Rattlesnakes and BHP, which is Bowden Hills. Um, they kind of overlap in terms of U distribution um, for parts of the year. Um, and then again, all those populations east of, uh, west of Highway 95, which aren't being discussed here already, um, have not been exposed to um, MOV, but are still important within the context of disease spread. So we'll let Ed talk about the initial spillover and what's been done since. 
Okay, so in November of 2003, we had a domestic scene on the sawtooth portion of this mountain. Um, from there, we had a pretty big die-off occur. We started testing those in 2004. Um, we had some bank samples that we went back in later and actually tested PCR positive for MOVI. Um, since that time, it seemed like that, that uh, spillover event kind of worked its way south towards Andorno and Peterman. And, and we for, thought for quite some time that we had um, everything cleared for the eight mile um, area. Calico and Martin Creek area, those came on a little bit later with some different releases. Um, in 2009, we started collaring animals in eight mile just for more of a movement because we, we were under the assumption that some of those rams were moving into Oregon side over there towards 10 mile and in and, and that country. Um, so we call our two adult males. They move between eight mile and 10 mile pretty regular. In the spring, they'd move over to 10 mile and then late fall, win uh, early winter, they'd come back into that eight mile country. Um, we had some collar failures, so we could never really pinpoint exactly when they'd be coming back. So in 2010, we, we were able to collar another adult male, which happened to be a, a male that we collared in 2009 that the collar failed. And we were able to track him into 10 mile. And, and just prior to him coming over from from the Oregon side, he was harvested in that 10 mile country. Um, from there, uh, as far as the two, uh, 2012 stuff, I'll let, I'll let Scott, you know, talk to that um, for the next few points and then I'll come in at the bottom here, if we can get Scott. Yeah, uh, if you guys can hear me, so. Um, and to compliment, uh, the work Nevada was doing, we, we collared another 10 sheep in that uh, rattlesnake herd and just and 10, 10 miles well just to see what was going on as far as movements. And then after we got um, disease results back, um, Five of our 10 sheep ended up coming back ELISA positive for MOV. And so that really, you know, it, you know, reinforced that movement between these herds. And it that was new to us as far as being informed of, of that disease event, making it that far north into Oregon. So um, it we didn't get strain typing completed until 2015 when we had a ram that died in March. And we're able to tie that that same strain. So, you know, that's kind of we made made that connection through these herds. Um, so, and then additional work we've done too is with um, the start of Rob's project in 2016, um, and we worked on that for for three years. And then additional workers. <clears throat> Okay, Ed, go ahead. Scott, we may have you sit on the bench. We've done too is with um project in 2016. Um, and we worked on that for for, for three years and uh and colored a, a very large number of sheep and sampled a very large number of, of individuals as well. So Go ahead and finish that slide, Ed. All right, so uh, this year, uh, February, uh, we started sampling more of that southern end, the, the Andorna Peterman area. And to our surprise, we had the actual snowstorm strain of MOV detected in that southernmost portion of the range. So for a snowstorm positive individual to come from the snowstorm mountains, um, depending on the route it took, it, it, it would have had to travel 20 to 40 miles to get to the location where we caught it. So that's kind of where we're sitting right now that we have uh, 
that sheep was detected in that southern end. Um, so now we go forward, I guess. Go ahead, Rob. Um, sorry. So yeah, just in terms of connectivity, um, I threw this slide in. Um, it just shows Brownian bridge utilization distributions. So these are composites. So it's all the data that we've collected between 2016 and 2020, spatial data, and then um, created composites, seasonal composites for both ewes and rams. Um, and just wanted to show here basically how the use in panel A, um, how the site fidelity is pretty incredibly high um, across both summer and winter. And you can see from panels B and C that there's a fair amount of movement between these populations based off of the utilization distributions in both the winter and summer. Um, and although we didn't capture any movements between, um, between 10 mile and rattlesnakes, um, you know, we, we only cover, uh, only call it a fairly small uh, proportion of males across the system. So, um, and it, you can see that those utilization distributions are pretty close and the habitat is fairly well connected there. So we expect that those types of movements are feasible. And then just additionally here, this is just showing two rams, um, one in both in 2018, um, making fairly significant um, movements um, between different populations. Um, and this is for a single season. This was just the summer of 2018. And um, as people were talking to you earlier um, in panel B, um, you can see that this ram, which was a um, uh, eight mile ram, got fairly close, 20, 30 kilometers to the snowstorms. So there's a lot of movement between all these different subherds by rams. All right, so um, again, as Ed talked about, the spillover was fall of 03. We did um, testing then, of course, we didn't have PCR, but uh, thank gosh, we, we were able to have banked um, material and, and were able to confirm uh, that it was there in, in 04 or 03. Um, and then continue to test periodically until Rob's PhD project started in 16. And then we, we collaborated uh, with him when he was on the Nevada side and Oregon did the same when, when he was doing the Oregon side and, and got a ton of great information by subherd uh, primarily used and then, and then this just uh, left hook with the snowstorm strain that just showed up uh, likely just last fall, if not early winter, <clears throat> when we were starting to focus more on the Andorno herd for a test and remove. Um, and as Scott had talked earlier, first test was 2012 and then, um, a great amount of sampling was done 16 through 18. So Rob, go ahead and show and kind of highlight the prevalence rates. So yeah, this is just a breakdown of um, primarily the 2016 to 2018 work um, and then 2021, just the recent Andorna and Peterman details. Um, as you'll see, um, if you look at the MOV PCR prevalence, PCR prevalence was actually, if you exclude Andorna and Peterman, this recent um, new strain, you'll see that PCR prevalence was fairly low. Um, only three positive individuals were detected um, across the entire 2016 to 2018 study. One of those used was in rattlesnakes, one in eight mile, and then there was a ram out of Martin Creek. Um, all three have subsequently died. Um, one was to blue tongue, one was the male was a hunter, and the other one we're not sure. Um, but again, just emphasizing how this, you know, in how this specific strain has kind of worked its way through the system and prevalence is fairly low. Um, just in, and, oh, sorry, I should also just mention, um, we didn't model by population in terms of lamb survival, just because we didn't have the sample sizes to do so. But the way we structured our survival model, we looked at, um, 
basically we looked at detection of ME, MOV positive lambs and when MOV positive lambs were detected and those were from mortalities, we had a um, derived four month survival rate of 2% and um, in populations where um, MOV positive lambs weren't detected, it was approximately 45%. And that was for again, four month uh, lamb survival. Um, just in terms of other path pathogens that were detected, um, not all the individuals were sampled for this, but um, it's just a general list of viruses and bacteria. And then we did a small side project looking at um, uh, fecal parasites uh, in more detail, temporally and spatially um, in 2017 and 2018. I'll just put those up there for interest sake. Scott, can you go ahead and try to give us a snippet of the blue tongue sampling and mortality efforts? Yeah, we'll, we'll give it another shot here if you can hear me. Um, You're good now. Dang. Great. So, uh, we, you know, as Rob's previous uh, slide showed, we um, showed that these herds have been exposed to blue tongue and, and, and have fought that in the past. And so uh, our initial sampling in 2012 and the next uh, September, we had a few sheep die and just didn't know what it was. And, and, uh, and so it kind of left us scratching our heads. Um, but then in 2018, in September and October, we lost a fair number of sheep. And again, these are out of that rattlesnake or the far north. Um, we lost uh, six males and three three females, and it was attributed to blue tongue. Um, we only got one positive back, but, you know, it's just a lot of anecdotal evidence there. But because uh, a lot of our samples were highly scavenged by the time we got there, and and uh, I think the coyotes were pretty keen to some sheep were dying, and they were getting well fed. But uh, but yeah, so so definitely there's other... other um, things going on with blue tongue. Um, it's not so much a population limiting thing, uh, just a, a handful of sheep dying at that time of year. Um, it does kind of come with a, a little bit of a blessing. One of our PCR positive ewes in the rattlesnake herd did succumb to uh, blue tongue. And then the following year, we had a big pulse of lambs. So good things can come from the ending of other things. Somewhat. <laughs> All right. So, so Ed, give us um, some of the, you know, our our thoughts of how to approach a test and remove on this large meta population. Yeah. So, this this could be a, a very huge undertaking, obviously, from what you can see on that map. Um, talking about that and and Dorno Peterman heard now with that that uh, strain from the snowstorms in there, we figure it's kind of critical to start start the test and removal project on that south end and, and then hopefully move northward and eastward um, through the Nevada stuff. Um, like Rob was saying, everything on the west side of Highway 95 is all tested negative. So it's kind of critical that we don't have these herds kind of go into those. Um, so that's kind of the other ideas um, of, of starting with this, this test and removal. Um, along with all the live captures that we can do, we can, you know, sample for the MOV with the hunter harvested. Um, and then every spring and, and into August or whatever, work on, you know, lamb recruitment, see what our, our lamb production is. Um, we've already had some folks on the ground right now looking at lamb production. Um, so to give us a good baseline to see what we're going to be looking at in um, June, July, and even into August for survival in those areas. So that's kind of our thoughts is starting on that southern end and kind of working up that, that spur of the, the western slope of the Santa Rosas and then bleeding over into the Martin Creek, Calico, and Eight Mile area. Thanks, Ed. All right, so uh, our last slide is some what ifs. Um, you know, as, as Ed said, we probably we're really concerned about the spread of the snowstorm strain. Um, as you heard this 
earlier today from Matt, um, pretty virulent strain and um, maybe in conjunction with sinus tumors. Uh, Nate, are you still on? Yes, I am. Do you know of if we've had any positive sinus tumors from hunter harvest in the Santa Rosa's yet? Ooh, I'd have to look that up. Let me, why don't you keep talking and I'll see if yeah. I can pull that up. I'm not aware of any, but. Not either, but. I'm not so, sure. so here, here's one of the junctures we're at on terms of the trigger point. So if, if, if we don't detect the snowstorm strain in other herds, which we really hadn't planned on sampling the other subherds yet, um, but maybe we need to find some extra money and do that. Do we, um, and if we don't find it, and it's, it's only isolated to that Andorinal Peterman subherd, do we have a little hybrid where we like, maybe we should depopulate that subherd so that uh, we reduce the amount of time that those animals could be, especially the rams that could be moving uh, that strain northward. And we also have a dilemma to the south and I'll, I'll let Ed just give us just a, a one minute explanation that that also adds some complexity So I think what you're referring to is those rams that moved across 95 there towards a new population. Is that what you're talking yep, about? Yep, yep, the bloody rams. Yeah, so last, last spring during COVID, we had some, a new herd, as, well, previous year we had a, a new herd established that we, we actually put in in the bloody runs, which is the kind of a Southern extension of the Santa Rosas. It's crossed the highway and it's all in its own uh, separate unit, but we had some rams collared in there and we, we had, uh, I believe two of those rams in spring of 20, uh, yeah, spring of 20, move over to the Santa Rosas. And I started monitoring those just because we knew that, you know, the, the sheep in the Santa Rosas had that, that MOV over there. So those two rams pretty much hung out um, the entire summer with 10 other rams that they tied up with. Um, so I was monitoring them pretty closely. And then in the fall before breeding, those two rams came back across the highway into the new herd and brought another ram with them. Um, so that initiated us to do a capture in that area and test as many as those sheep that those rams were co co-mingling with a bunch of those ewes um, and believe it or not none of them tested positive nor did did the rams at the time so with that we wanted to kind of stymie any kind of movement from there either also right which further probably supports the the timing of that snowstorm strain spillover uh, which was probably late fall after, after the rut, or maybe even uh, as late as just a few weeks before we started sampling in February, um, where we would have probably seen that snowstorm strain in that new herd in the Bloody Runs to the south. So, and then the other alternative is, what if we do sample the Martin Creek the sawtooth subherd that are closest to that Andorno herd, and we find the snowstorm strain has leapfrogged. Uh, do we wait uh, until the prevalence goes down for the snowstorm strain? Um, so we're we're not quite sure how to how to move forward. Um, so we yes we've we've started testing. And um, it's going to be primarily helicopter, uh, really no opportunities for darting or drop net. Um, and as stated by others, you know, we're, we're going to uh, 
Uh, we're concerned about the disturbance to the, the sheep having to capture them multiple times. Um, but as you saw the numbers, the relatively small, each of the suburbs is relatively small. So I think they, it is doable. And between making sure that we don't contribute to more spillovers west of Highway 95, and then just the enormous, awesome bighorn habitat that's unoccupied in the snow in the Santa Roses. It's just we just feel like we need to take action. Um, this herd was 350 plus in the early 2000s before that spillover hit, and it it it, it probably could support 500 or more. So so that's kind of where we're at. So. Would love to get some thoughts and input from everyone. Hey, hey Mike, so I just looked it up. Um, so we did have our first vote. Uh, can you still hear me? My yep, is... go ahead. Okay. Um, we did have our first positive this year for sinus tumor. So one of the, it was the, one of the mortalities we had out of Santa Rosa. I'm trying to figure out which animal it was right now, but it looks like we did have a positive. Was That probably was the ram that was captured that we were gonna sample and put a collar on, and it died in the hands of the capture crew. Is that yeah, the one? I guess, I wanted to double check that. Right, um, its lungs were pretty pretty trashed uh, with bronchial. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that was the one, Nate, that we talked about. 127, was it 1271? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, he had, did have sinus tumor. Yeah, and, and we don't know the origin of that ram. I mean, unless we do DNA, which we haven't done yet, but I guess we could. So with this second strain spillover, uh, anyone's thoughts on how, how to move forward? Quickly. Francis, of course, please. Well, I just said quickly. <laughs> I don't I don't really know. You know, there's so many un I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think you're gonna stop an outbreak. Um, can you prevent one? Possibly. So I guess that's what you're saying. That's your goal is to prevent an outbreak um, Well, as you, snowstorms. I mean, you've got so many things <laughs> trying to do there, but. Well, and the other thing is we think now that we have, I'm not saying there's a boomerang that's gonna happen to the snowstorms, but um, we feel like we've, as Matt said, we, we, we had our challenge in 2019, but now we think we did get the last of the PCR positives and the snowstorms. And as you saw, by not taking action in 2004, now we've we've got seven suburbs that have the Santa Rosa strain. So yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think swiftly, quickly is 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 probably gonna be the 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 need. And what do you think about Scorch Earth on and Dorno, depending on what we find in other suburbs. Yeah, I think you have to play it, you know, see what you, like be prepared to um, depopulate if you need to, but um, you might not need to. Would you, I mean, we're gonna have to get some extra money because we were just gonna focus on Andorno, but it, it seems like we probably better know what's going on with the neighboring suburbs. Yeah. I would say that area, I don't know all the other stuff you have going, but it seems like that area would have to be, should be pretty high priority because it's kind of urgent. Yep. Well, we'll be um, doing a lot of planning here in the next few weeks. And then 
Uh, Scott had actually a, a meeting with his staff. Um, you know, they're definitely, I think, supportive of what odf and w is, but uh, kind of kind of waiting for us to dip our toe in the water and and as we move north, um, they'll, they'll likely continue to do the work on their side. Yeah, Mike, that's definitely something we can consider moving forward. There's obviously a lot of questions we've got to answer, and and uh, and I think this present or this uh, meeting has helped, uh, you know, with a lot of guidance and and understanding of what other other uh, agencies have done to manage this this process. So yeah, we'll definitely be moving forward with a little, with a lot more information. All right, well, thanks everyone. And uh, thanks to my presenters. I can just say that I'm really happy that Nate is dealing with this and, and I no longer have to deal with that situation. <laughs> oh, <it> sounds bad. <laughs> Yeah, he, thank you all. That was good. Perry, not only did he have to start at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, we had a domestic sheep, wild sheep interaction like two weeks after he started, or maybe it was the week that he started. And uh, yeah, he, he got thrown to the wolves, you know, as Ed did, because guess what? He started his field position in 2003 and he was gifted this mess yeah that's that's why it's the notice, nevada way that's why if you notice uh i don't have any hair left neither does mike so nate's not far behind <laughs> Nate, nate's nate's <laughs> got to keep that mustache so he's got something going <laughs> yeah. mike you mike you just really helped endow's recruiting chances <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as soon as you as soon as you step into your position, we we give you a curveball. <laughs> okay, moving on, Montana. We're going to hear from Vanna Bocadori, who is the Butte Area Wildlife Biologist for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. She's been there for over. 16 years and uh, she's been trying to nurse the Highlands bighorn sheep population back from a die-off in the mid-90s without much success. So she's looking for wisdom from this group. All right, so and we can see your slides. Good. I was going to say the first wisdom might be um, helping me get my slideshow up, but can everybody see that okay? Yeah, then it's if, the, it, it's notes, it's if your you notes wanna, presentation. If you want to just go up to display settings and switch your screen. Okay, let's see. There you go. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so you can see my presentation, not the presenter stuff. Okay. Yep. Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank the Wild Sheep uh, working group for putting on this workshop. It's a great opportunity. I think a lot of us probably are sitting here with um, herds that we've been trying to manage, trying to uh, nurse through post die-offs. And so this has just been a great opportunity to hear what other people are doing and the similarities that might be able to be applied. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm going to present on the Highlands Bighorn Sheep Herd. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background, the current status, and kind of what I and a few others from Montana are thinking about with it. Um, but I'm going to try to keep it short so there's um, enough time. I really want to hear back from all of you what your thoughts are and um, pick your brains a little bit. So. Um, so with that, let me just kind of point out where the Highlands Bighorn Sheep Herd is. It's in southwest Montana, kind of halfway between Butte and Dillon. Um, the I-15 highway um, intersects their uh, range, but it really doesn't seem to pose much threat to um, mortality. I mean, occasionally um, there's one that gets hit on the highway, but usually that's less than one a year. 
And um, forgive my unicorn icon. Um, I could not find a bighorn sheep. I thought a unicorn would be appropriate. So anyway. Um, so the history of this herd, it was uh, the highlands did contain uh, sheep historically. And then um, the native population was extirpated in the early 1900s. And then the late 1960s, the herd was reestablished using stock from um, other Montana herds. Um, the success of that transplant and the augmentations, a few augmentations um, in the decades following was really successful. By the early 1990s, there were 300 to 400 sheep in that herd, uh, 35 ram tags being given out, 35 ewe tags. Um, in 1994, there is an all-age die-off. Um, this story is similar to what a lot of you um, have heard today and or experience with your herd. So um, that die-off was a pneumonia-related die-off event, um, left about 10% of the population on the ground. Um, there is potential that um, it may have been tied in part to um, a domestic commingling event, but that's never really been proven. So um, since that die off, uh, there were augmentations that happened between 2000 and 2008 from five different Montana source herds. None of those augmentations really seem to um, help push the population past a, a bottleneck and get it uh, off and running again. So the biggest um, transplant or augmentation occurred in 2008 when we got 50 some sheep that we brought in from the Sun River herd, thinking that, and most of those were used. I think maybe there were just five out of those, um, out of that bunch that were rams or one lamb, I think. Um, but that really didn't seem to help, uh, didn't still uh, have persisted with lamb pneumonia and poor recruitment. So um, in the years since I've been here, um, we have had intermittent radio tracking from 2007 through 2017. Uh, and that has been um, in thanks in large part to funding from the Wild Sheep Foundation, the Montana um, Wild Sheep Foundation, local rod and gun clubs. Um, and then I've had several uh, Volunteers, uh, mainly in the form of students, um, both high school and college uh, kids who have fresh legs and are eager and they help me track these sheep, uh, VHF collars. So uh, of course the sample size is never as robust as you would like it to be, um, but still over 10 years, uh, we were able to gather some data that was useful in helping to kind of describe the herd structure in the Highlands population. Um, and so it, we do have, from that radio tracking um, effort there, it looks like we do have a metapopulation structure with five different subherds. Um, and similar to, um, I think it was Jeffrey's uh, presentation on his herd, there's not much mileage between some of these subherds. Uh, it might be anywhere from five miles to 25 miles. Um, so it's a pretty tight confine in there. The current population size is about 120 animals. That might be estimated a little low, um, but so that's probably a minimum, maybe as many as 150. Uh, management goal would be to try to get that up more towards 200, 250 animals. Um, overall, the population is stable, but when you look at it within these subherds, it definitely appears that there is a source sink dynamic going on, where some subherds have very poor lamb recruitment and others have medium or relatively high lamb recruitment. That kind of floats the overall population. So. Um, production it appears to be very good across all the subherds. Um, that does not seem to be the problem. Um, it's just the lamb survival that's the problem. So um, I put uh, some domestic sheep icons on here and those are meant to represent domestic sheep. Um, so there is the potential for co-mingling, um, especially with the notch bottom herd, which hopefully you can see that it's not too small. 
it's that southernmost subherd. Um, and I should say that each one of those three um, domestic sheep uh, producers, they're relatively small producers, you know, anywhere from uh, probably a dozen to uh, maybe 50 um, with the, uh, the one at the northern or northwest side, um, that one being probably the largest. Um, and to my knowledge, um, in talking with the producer, there's not been any uh, known co-mingling event with that domestic um, population at the northwest end of the Highlands herd, um, nor with the one that's in the southwest. But there's potential because of the close proximity for there to be co-mingling with the notch bottom herd. So. Um, so disease status, um, I'm going to kind of break this down into the five different um, subgroups and just kind of give you a quick overview um, of the kind of the profile for each one. Um, in 2016, we did do a health assessment, um, but I, I want to say that the sample sizes were pretty small, you know, anywhere from four to six ewes for the most part, there was one um, yearling ram that was captured. Um, and we did not get samples from all five of the subherds. You can see on that table, we got samples from the Foothills subherd, from the Notch Bottom subherd, and from the LaMarche group. Uh, we did not get them from Red Mountain or Sheep Mountain. Um, but I want to just kind of describe each one of these subherds to you um, because I it really I think um, it's important uh, the dynamics within each one. So um, the foothill subherd that is a non-migratory herd that mainly was um, established from 2007-2008 uh, transplants that we did. We have persistent pneumonia in that herd um, and no doubt there are chronic um, shedders in there. And earlier Frances had said in one of her talks that um, older ewes are likely, uh, more likely to be carriers. I have old ewes in there. Um, there's still some remnants from that 2008 transplant because we had put radio collars or um, neck bands on all the ewes that we released and there's still some of those out there. Um, this herd has really poor lamb survival. I mean, pretty close to zero, definitely less than 20. Um, the other thing about it is there was a summer pneumonia event. Um, we released them in January of 2018. And then that summer, there was a pneumonia event. Um, and you know, definitely seem to be an all-age event. Of course, you know, you never find all the um, the carcasses, and we didn't have radio collars on everything, but um, just based on where we did have radio collars or opportunistic sightings, um, it, it appeared to be an all-age die-off, um, but didn't, I'm guessing it probably took about 20 animals out of um, the 50 that we had released there. So significant. Um, in that notch bottom herd, um, this is a herd has an interesting um, history. It was pioneered by two radio collared ewes um, who had been released in the Foothills subherd uh, in 2007. And then a year later, they showed up about 25 air miles to the south with their two lambs and a yearling ewe. And for the next um, eight years, nine years, they did really well. They had really good lamb production, lamb survival, and that herd increased from the initial five to closer to 45. In the past several years, um, we've had a steady presence of pneumonia in that herd. Um, lambs that are coughing, adults that are dying and uh, being confirmed as having had pneumonia. Um, and you can see in that 2016 health assessment um, that her did test po uh, positive for uh, serum of MOB, but it tested negative for the PCR. Um, it's there's a high, as I said earlier, there's a high chance that this herd does mingle with domestic sheep. 
Um, and it's also highly dependent on irrigated um, agricultural crops um, within its um, kind of home range there, um, especially in the late summer when the vegetation in the hills dries up. Um, they are highly dependent on um, sand foreign and alfalfa. So um, there's that going on, which might make them really easy to capture with the drop net in late summer. So uh, think about that. Um, the Sheep Mountain and LaMarche herds, those two were basically, those two subherds were created in 2014 um, from about, uh, I think, 11 ewes that we brought from the breaks. Um, they were considered naive sheep as far as being relatively clean, and then we put them in um, with the Highlands herd where we knew we had pneumonia. Um, the interesting thing about that is, you know, a year later, um, January 2016, when we did the health assessment, some ewes from that LaMarche herd, and they uh, tested negative for both the MOV serum and PCR. Um, and it appears that the lamb survival is pretty decent um, in those two subherds. They are only a few miles from each other, um, but there doesn't appear to be much mixing. Um, between the ewes, or at least at the time. I don't have any um, viable collars in there anymore, so I'm not sure in the past couple years, but um, for the three or four years that we were able to track them, they, there was not much uh, mixing amongst the ewes in those two subherds. Um, both of them do have dependency on irrigated ag fields. Probably not to the extent that Notch Bottom does, um, but enough that once again, they could, uh, that could lend uh, those herds to being good candidates for drop net captures in the late summer. So, um, the Red Mountain herd is what I would call the only relic population from, it has, it retained the migratory patterns of pre-1994 die-off. Um, it is the only migratory um, herd that uh, within these five subherds, and they seem to have decent lamb survival. Um, so I would say the Sheep Mountain, La Marche, and Red Mountains are possibly the source populations, and then Foothills and Notch Bottom definitely appear to be um, sink populations. Um, as far as disease management goes, you know, it was what we've been doing to try to manage for this, um, it's We've never really seen a full recovery in the past 25, 26 years since that um, all age die off. Um, and we've tried augmentations, you know, early on when before all this uh, latest, greatest research has shown us that that's probably not a smart thing to do to be moving sheep around. Um, there was that, that one health assessment in 2016. And then just annual monitoring, most, uh, mostly from the air at this point, um, as I no longer have any viable um, VHF collars. Um, but recently, in the past year or so, um, Montana had just finished up the what we call the Montana Bighorn Sheep Study, a seven-year sheep study that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, so looking at some of the findings from that effort and then um, just listening to the, uh, the results and findings and experiences from several of you today. Um, Kelly Prophet and Emily Alberg and Jennifer Ramsey and I um, have been kind of tossing around ideas and put together a project proposal for the bighorn sheep. Um, our initial thought was to, since we have these subherds that are um, sinks that you know, maybe we do subherd removals once we confirm that, in fact, we do have um, these chronic carriers in there. And I like Mike Cox's um, the scorch earth. Maybe just go in there and scorch earth with these two subherds. Um, but after today's um, talks, um, I'm a little bit more optimistic that going in and testing for individuals as carriers and removing them. Uh, might be uh, a feasible and more palatable way to go. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, three of those herds are probably candidates for drop net capture, which is, um, you know, attractive in that regard because logistically it's much easier, more bang for the buck. Um, 
but the other two herds are going to be difficult um, and probably more of a helicopter capture and likely in the winter time um, to utilize that snow for softer landing. Um, but then of course you throw in the variable of mixing, you know, depending on what we're doing, uh, if we're trying to make some uh, assessments uh, with va um, different variables, you don't want a late summer and a winter helicopter uh, capture. So anyway, just some thoughts. Um, but with that, I do want to kind of, it is my hope um, that we could uh, take advantage um, again of some of the findings from the Montana uh, bighorn sheep study um, and look uh, not just at the pathogen uh, community and do this uh, test and removal, but to kind of incorporate the, this epidemiological triad where we're actually looking at the environment and the host too and trying to get some understanding. This was a conversation that came up uh, a few times today. <clears throat> um, and I just want to circle back around to it of you know, what, what um, bearing do some of these other factors have on disease expression and um, test and removal um, is one component of it, but as far as uh, remedying the situation as it is right now, but how do we maybe uh, understand the environment a little bit better to keep it from potentially happening again. Um, so just some thoughts are, uh, and again, um, coming from some of the work that was done in the Montana uh, sheep study. Um, so in the environment, looking at trace mineral profiles, looking at the nutritional status within the subherds, um, you know, how are we doing with those things? Uh, those non-migratory subherds, um, are they getting the right amount of trace minerals? And if they are dependent at a certain time of year on monocrop, agricultural monocrop, are they, you know, getting the nutritional status uh, that they need or is that draining them somehow? Um, and then we talked about this today several times, you know, what role do the rams have? So that would be um, included into the study design as well. So, um, so basically looking at, you know, not just the pathogens and the the test and removal, which is definitely very important, but maybe looking at um, uh, the RAMs and the environmental factors as well to answer the ultimate question of how all this um, affects lamb survival and overall herd health. Um, so with that, I am going to um, stop and um, hopefully there'll be some good feedback. Great. Thank you, Vanna. That's that was well done, very comprehensive. Um, so we can continue questionings and then take a break, or if everybody's on the verge of wetting their pants or needing a snack, we can take the break now and then come back and kind of wrap your questions into the full ending of the program. If nobody speaks up, then we'll just keep. Um, I just want we'll, to thank we'll run run these out. I just want to thank Vanna for stepping forward, and um, sometimes it's not easy or comfortable to uh, bring something up that is not is not something fun to talk about. That twenty five years of of uh, poor performance, but. Um, I think you've got a great idea of moving forward and my hat's off to you and, and others that you're going to work with, including Emily and, and Jennifer, and hopefully someday the Highlands can be, um, what it was before. That's the hope. Yep. Yep. I also, I'm also thought you did a really nice job and, um, this looks really good, your proposal. Thank you. Hey, you all want to take a quick break, a 10 minute break?
Yes. Yeah, let's do that, Perry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep, I think everybody needs to step away. <laughs> okay, I have a quarter, quarter till the hour, whichever time zone you're in. So let's let's try to be back in 10 minutes at five until, and then um, we'll be fresh and we can we can interact with Vanna and talk about um, depopulation possibilities. Okay, see y'all then. Thanks, Perry. Thank you.